Welcome to the Inconvenient Minority Podcast. I'm your host, Kenny Shu. Joining me today, I have the esteemed pleasure of bringing in guest Peter Orsidiakono, who was the lead economist in the Students for Fair Admissions versus Harvard case. He was the one who analyzed the thousands and thousands of pages of Harvard admit admissions data and came to the conclusion that Harvard does discriminate against Asian Americans. We're going to be going in depth in this case today uh, and also talking about some of the other projects that Peter has been interested in working on in his life. Uh, Peter, it's great to have you on this podcast. Oh, it's great to be here. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, so I guess before we get into what our, our listeners are presumably very interested in learning about, I want to learn a little bit, I want our listeners to learn a little bit about your own life and your own your own background um, and how you became sort of interested in the education issue, because I think you spent most of your career working on education, particularly higher education. And why does, um, I guess, uh, fighting for justice in education really matter to you? Well, it's interesting because I'm not sure I would say that I've been fighting for justice, more um, fighting for truth. Sure. I mean, I'm definitely supportive of justice without a doubt. But, uh, you know, as an academic, I feel like that's what the point is, is to, you know, really understand how the world works. And I think I'm drawn to areas where um, the, the thinking is, is uh, around an agenda and trying to see what the truth is. Um, you know, what's really going on. Right. So, you know, I guess yeah, we, 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 go ahead. regard to, you know, how do we view differences in majors and what do we make of affirmative action and those, those types of issues. And uh, so you're an economist at, at Duke right now. What, what brought you to Duke? Was it the, was it the place that sort of accepted your writing? Um, was it the place where did you have multiple options and you chose Duke? What was the reason why you were brought to Duke? after getting your PhD in economics? Well, my joke is that, that God doesn't trust me with choices. Um, <laughs> when I applied to graduate school, I got into one grad school and got turned down from programs that were much worse than the one I, I went to. Wisconsin's a good program. Um, but then when I applied for jobs, uh, you know, the only academic offer I got was actually Duke's, so it uh, it worked out very well. Um, you know, at the time, both my wife and I are from the Pacific Northwest, so uh, that was our preference. But um, it worked out very well for us to be here. Sure, yeah, that's good. I'm glad it worked out, and you're clearly doing really important work. And one of the most important things that you've done so far um, is take up the immense responsibility of uh, <laughs> of of looking at the truth about what's happening in the most prestigious college in the entire world, which is Harvard University, Harvard College. So you you, you developed a sort of framework for how you look at for how you look at this issue. Um, why don't you explain to the listeners how you decided that you wanted to approach the question of, is there discrimination against Asian American applicants at Harvard? So there's a lot into that goes into that. Um, I think that there's different ways that discrimination can unfold. And there's a sense in which I view a lot of what I did in the Harvard case is giving Harvard the benefit of the doubt. And I say that in the following way, which is, uh, I took sort of their admissions criteria as given in the sense that there, there are things that, you know, you may think Harvard really shouldn't be using that particular rating. I think about the athletic rating in particular, you know, where they give a, an athletic rating for everybody. Um, and the people who do best on that athletic rating tend to be white legacies. Um, we're going to control for that in our model. The only things that we're not going to control for are variables where we can clearly establish that um, race affects those variables. 
So those can be a means through which discrimination um, can happen. So basically, we're going to try to account for all the possible differences between applicants and see, well, what, what, um, what's left over there? And even when we think about what's left over, it could still be the case that on some unobserved dimension, one group um, could be weaker than another group. But you have to make the case for why, why that would be there and, and it, is that case plausible. And in the case of Asian Americans at Harvard, I, I just don't find it at all plausible. Um, I am the type of person who, you know, throughout sets a pretty high bar for what counts as discrimination, uh, precisely because, um, you know, I, I think it is a, a difficult to prove and probably part of me doesn't want to believe people would do something like that. <laughs> Uh, but in this case, I think, um, the evidence is, you know, as strong as it gets, uh, that there is discrimination. So just to explain the listeners, what Harvard does, um, to its applicants that you sort of take as given Harvard grades people on certain criteria. Those criteria include academics, what it calls academics, uh, what it calls extracurriculars. They, ha- they give an athletic rating for those who are athletes, and they give a personal rating, a, a personality score, effectively. Am I missing anything? So there's also um, the teacher recommendations and the counselor sure. recommendations. You've got the alumni interviewer. There's a whole the, – the number of controls that we've got in these models is pretty astounding. I think that there's another place that um, definitely plays a role, which is that all applications are assigned to dockets. And dockets are basically regions of the country. And so if you think about something like wanting geographical diversity, uh, that can actually also work against Asian Americans. So and part of that reason is because Asian Americans are doing so well, Regions that have disproportionately more Asian Americans are going to have more applications to Harvard. And so you actually show that, that, um, you know, dockets that have a higher fraction Asian American tend to have lower admit rates. Uh, so, an Asian, so an Asian American who, say, lives in the South might with the same objective metrics as an, as an Asian American who lives in the Northeast might have a better chance at Harvard than the Asian American in the Northeast. Is, is that, is that one implication? That's one implication. I think it's particular. I'm not sure if um, Asian Americans are so overrepresented in the Northeast, but like California, for example, um, that's going to be mm-hmm. the case. But then does the Asian American penalty extend across all geographic regions? So that gets, I think it's harder to show um, just because of the sample sizes that, um, you know, how the penalty operates differently across those, those regions. So certainly CARD, you know, my counterpart would argue that if anything, you might not see the discrimination happening in California. Uh-huh. I think well, because, hard, that- because, because CARD would argue that the discrimination that 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 you would presuppose to be attributed to Asians are actually is actually discrimination against you know certain geographical regions just because those regions get more applicants and so there is um, it's not necessarily discrimination against Asians it's just discrimination against regions in which Asians tend to congregate. Well, I, so actually, you can't really make that argument because we control for all of that. So that would be an example of something where because we're actually controlling what docket um, you're from, um, as well as a host of measures regarding your characteristics of your high school and your neighborhood, um, you can't really make that argument. More the argument that he makes is that if you look only at California applicants, and you make a series of what I view as very bad modeling choices, then you can sort of 
find uh, you know no effect. And there's a number of issues with that. One are the modeling choices, um, but another is that as you throw away um, a, a lot of the data, it, it gets harder to find the effect um, just because of le less power. And this was a, a trick that Carr did, you know, with regard to the personal rating. So what happens in any of the models of admissions, mine or... So before we get to the personal rating, sorry, I just want to tell the listeners who David Card is. So in the Students for Fair Admissions versus Harvard trial, um, the there are two, I guess you would, there are two economists who presented different arguments as to whether Harvard discriminated against Asian Americans. Peter Sidiakono was the economist that presented the evidence that Harvard did discriminate against Asian Americans, but then David Card, um, who Harvard hired um, as, as their representative economist, and yes, Peter was um, brought in by Students for Fair Admissions, but David Card, who, who was hired by Harvard, brought in evidence or brought in a model to suggest that Harvard didn't discriminate against Asian Americans. So David Card is, I guess, this is, this is sort of, uh, this is what a Peter is referring to here. Uh, is that accurate? That's right. And, and David Card and I have always had a good relationship. I do admire him quite a bit. I just deeply disagree um, with him on, on this case. According, if you control for things like geographic diversity, high school, neighborhood, first of all, do you have a large enough sample size that you, can't, that you can control for all of those things? Well, it, it depends on what you're trying to measure. So, you know, if we're talking about discrimination across the six years of data, then yes, you can put in a lot of, of, of variables in there and you've got enough power to distinguish them. If you do something where you're only going to estimate on one year of data, then that becomes more difficult. Uh, just because we wouldn't have the power, so and that's so that was one of the points of contention: is do you estimate a yearly model or one that averages across the six years? Now, on that point, you know, Card's going to estimate yearly models and then average across those six years across all the yearly um, estimates. But what you can't do is then say, well, if you look at any one year look, there's no effect here because you don't have the power to pick up an effect. And that's what he did with the personal rating. So as it turns out, no matter what you do, no matter what bad modeling decisions you make, as soon as you take out the personal rating, if you can see that the personal rating is contaminated by bias against Asian Americans, no matter what you do across those six years, you're always going to see a penalty against Asian Americans. Now, what Card did with that result was to say, but look, if you look at any given year, you only find a significant penalty in one of those years. And the problem with that is you don't have the power um, you know, to really distinguish that. Some of those estimates show a massive penalty against Asian Americans, but they're not significant because there's too much, too much noise. This, this is, so I read both of your arguments. I studied them. And um, I remember what Carr did to show that the personality rating or to, to show that Asian Americans are, um, not, are not actually discriminated against because of race, but because of what he called unobserved factors, unobserved factors or non-academic non factors, I think is what he said, non-academic factors. Asians, what he showed and what he said in his model was that Asians score lower on non-academic factors um, than... Um, than whites or blacks or Hispanics. And so that gives Harvard the justification to admit Asians in a lower proportion than, um, than, than the other races 
What's your response to that? Or how do you see that? Well, so it's interesting the way that that operates. So the first thing is, you know, on the personal score, you could be looking at were Asian Americans worse on the observables associated with the personal score. Carr does not do that. So when he talks about the Asian Americans be, being worse, he's not talking about the personal score itself. No matter what you do on the personal rating, you find a penalty against Asian Americans with no evidence that um, white applicants are stronger on the observables associated with the personal rating. Don't Asian Americans score lower on teacher recommendations than whites, though? They do. So, but that's just one part of it. So when mm-hmm. I say that, uh, you know, that once you account for everything, that's just one part of it. You could say, okay, well, on that they score um, worse. And actually, even when you say they score worse, it's, they only actually score worse after you account for everything else. So in my mind, there may be actually evidence of a penalty against Asian Americans in the teacher recommendations as well. And, and to clarify that, this doesn't mean that the teachers themselves are doing it because um, they're not the one who gives the score. It's the admissions officer who gives the score. But even accounting for that, there's enough that goes into that personal rating that would say that Asian Americans, um, if anything, would have characteristics associated with being more likely to be scored high in the personal rating. And so, a great example of that is that Asian Americans. Um, what, one of the things that's in the database is whether or not you're disadvantaged. And that's a um, uh, guess by the admissions officer based on your profile of, of whether they think you come from a uh, relatively poor household. And Asian Americans are actually much more likely to be labeled disadvantaged than white applicants. And you actually see that if you are disadvantaged, you're more likely to get um, a higher score on the personal rating. Uh Uh-huh. Huh. So once you take into account the various factors that affect the personal rating and sort of add up all those factors, on the observable stuff associated with the personal rating, Asian Americans are at least as strong as white applicants. So are you saying then that well, I guess walk me through the the admissions officer's mentality then, um, or at least the way that you see it. Are you saying that the admissions officer, when they see that somebody is disadvantaged, maybe implicitly like wants to up their personality score? Well, I think that that's it's, and really, I should say it is a personal score, not um, personality, but the personal score. Um, I think it's reflective of that part of what can enter into that score is sort of overcoming adversity um, can be part of it. I mean, there's lots of stuff that goes into it, like evervescence and likability. Uh, but that, but you know, part of it is, um, you know, have you overcome, overcome uh, struggles? But I do want to bring it back is you, I, I don't feel like I fully address this issue about card saying that whites are actually stronger on the non-academics. Yeah, sorry, keep going. So the first thing is it was a bit of a bait and switch, right? Because when he makes that statement, that's not about the personal rating. That is about admissions. So you say, look, we're going to tell you that the personal rating is not biased by looking at results from the admissions model, not from the the model of the personal rating. Mm Mm-hmm. So then when we say, okay, Asian Americans are weaker on the stuff associated with the um, non-academics on admissions, Mm -hmm. that depends on how you calculate that and what groups you're using. So in CARD's initial model, part of what was counted as non-academics was the fact that legacies and athletes get a big bump in admissions, and that was considered to be non-academic. Well, that's and th- those are the numbers that the judge actually cites is from that model, right? And so what do you know 
athletes who the, the people who are most likely to be athletes at Harvard are white, and people who are most likely to be legacies at Harvard are white. When all that enters into the and they get huge bumps in admissions, of course it looks like Asian Americans are worse on the non academics associated with that. Mm -hmm. Now the other part to it too is that there are other things, even if you take that out, that are still going to make it look like Asian Americans might be worse on that. As an example, if you include athletes and legacies in the model, things like whether or not you um, got an interview with the admissions officer, that's going to show up as part of the non-academic part. Well, the primary people who get interviews with um, admissions officers are athletes, followed by other more advantaged groups. So whites are a lot more likely to get those interviews. So that makes it look like they're stronger. But if you focus on where I believe the discrimination is occurring, and this was a big point of contention in the trial, I don't think it's happening against Asian American legacies or Asian American athletes. I think it's happening against the typical applicants. And for them, you know, you can't cut it in a way where whites are significantly stronger than Asians on the non-academics. So if I had to summarize what you're saying about Card's main argument and the problems that you have with it, Card's main argument is that um, Harvard's not discriminating against Asians per se, Harvard is lowering admissions for people that they deem less qualified on the non-academic scale, um, which includes things like personality scores and being an athlete and legacy and everything like that. But what you're saying is that embedded within the so-called non-academic profile um, are certain systems that already advantage whites. Uh, that have no, that have nothing to do with the person's actual merit or or um, qualifications, even from a non-academic perspective, such as being a legacy, such as being an athlete. Um, those are disproportionately, much disproportionately white, um, and so you can't use just the fact that Asians are lower on non-academics as a appropriate justification. Um, to say, no, there isn't discrimination against Asians. Well, so his argument was that if more stuff was revealed about the person, the stuff that's currently not in the model, that it would be non-academic stuff. And my claim would be, look, things like legacy status – that's not that they're actually one, that they're actually stronger on non-academic stuff. That's a preference. So you can't count that as part of it. And that's not something that we, re we revealed if you had more information about the applicants. But then to come back, the double switch, though, was that it wasn't even on the personal rating, which was the point of contention. The point of, you know, the point of contention was, does the personal rating belong in the model? Sure. And there's no evidence that he's got to support it, um, that the, the race doesn't affect the personal rating. Hmm. Hmm. Interesting. And, and what's so, interesting is, is that is in contrast, so there was agreement that the overall rating, which is also in the data set, um, should not be in the model. And that's because Harvard acknowledges that race affects the overall rating. Yeah. Now, to me, I look at the patterns in the personal rating and they look just like the patterns in the overall rating. The difference is, is Harvard doesn't admit that race is used in the personal rating. Mm -hmm. um, and so the, uh, so this is the contention. So now we're getting to the part of this contention in the personal rating between you and Card and ultimately the district court's decision on that. So when you say the patterns in the personal rating are similar, Asians score lowest on personal rating followed by blacks, Hispanics, or, or whites? 
followed by whites, followed by Hispanics, and I think blacks are the highest, or black Americans are the highest? Well, it depends on if, you, if you're talking about the raw differences or after you account for the characteristics that affect the personal rating. Yeah. So once you account for the, the characteristics that affect the personal rating, then you see the, the pattern of black scoring the, the highest by far, followed by Hispanics, then whites, then Asian Americans. And that's exactly what you see with the overall rating, too. Right. Now, what's also striking about it is that if you're a disadvantaged black student, you still get a big bump for being black, but you don't get the bump for being disadvantaged or it's significantly muted. And that's true for both the overall rating and the personal rating. And that just strikes me as saying, look, this is a place where we're trying to get some balancing to happen. Black students are much more likely to be labeled disadvantaged. We sort of give you a, a bump if you're black, a, a bump, smaller bump if you're disadvantaged. But if you're both, we're not going to give you both bumps. That's also what you see in admissions. So to me, you know, the overall rating, the personal rating, and admissions sort of all follow the same pattern of how preferences operate. So you already give Harvard a lot of deference on like, okay, your academic ratings are probably not discriminatory. Your extracurricular ratings are probably not discriminatory. But you draw this line at the personal rating and you say, I can't give Harvard deference that their personal ratings are necessarily accurate measures of a person and, uh, or, 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 or measures of the actual meritoriousness, even the personality meritoriousness of a person. And uh, why do you do that? Well, it may be that there's something in there that um, does measure that, but the problem is, is it's so clearly contaminated by the fact that racial preferences operate directly in it. And so typically what happens when you're looking at models of discrimination is that you start off with a gap and then, you know, uh, say that in the labor market, we see that black men earn less than white men and the gap starts out as large. But once you account for differences in background, you know, the fact that there's is it really that the employers are paying them less because they're black or is it that our educational system has sort of failed blacks so don't have as strong of academic preparation as, as others? Once you start accounting for that, typically the racial gaps get smaller. That's not true here. And so like on something like the personal rating, um, you know, blacks overall actually have lower personal ratings than whites. But once you start, but the difference is small, but once you start accounting for differences in their background, now uh, the gaps increase. That's not what you generally find with discrimination. It's generally that once you account for things, discrimination shrinks because it's a proxy for other other factors. Here we're not, we, we sort of see the opposite, which is indicative of preferences, where look, we know we want more of this particular group, so we're going to give them a bump um, on this rating and in admissions. Where we have too many of this particular group, we're going to give them a penalty here and a penalty in admissions. Got it. So there is some sort of intervention. It, there, there's an intervention for racially balancing purposes um, during the application process that is embedded in the personal rating. Yeah, and the kicker is, you know, mm -hmm. that's not the only personal rating in the data. We actually use one of the personal ratings in the model because we have what the alumni interviewer 
uh, score them on the personal rating. And you could also think about that as um, a way of overcoming stereotypes, right? So if, if you have these stereotypes against a racial group that are wrong, then by actually interacting with that group, then you find out they're wrong and adjust accordingly. So, you know, the penalty, you just get such uh, a different um, effect for being Asian American in the personal rating as assigned by the admissions officer, who, you know, 98% of the time is not meeting, um, not interviewing them, compared to the alumni who actually meet them. And that's very striking because, if anything, I would have expected that that would be a way for Harvard to um, discriminate, would be to have their um, alumni who are primarily white uh, interview. The the alumni probably haven't gone through diversity training. (laughs) Um, and, And yet we see that it's really the admissions officers themselves where you see the massive gap. Um, and what's what's stunning about this is Harvard knows it. We've got a, a slide from the their Office of Institutional Research where they show the different ratings and how the personal rating for Asian Americans is such an outlier relative to the alumni personal rating and, and relative to all of their other ratings. So, you know, on this particular figure, You can see that Asian Americans either score much better than whites or the same as whites. And this is sort of overall, except on the personal rating, where it shoots off uh, as being very negative for Asian Americans. Yeah. So one thing that um, one thing that uh, that that I saw in Card's reply or Card's data or model um, was that he has this section in this model where he says available uh, data does not indicate that race is a determinative factor in admissions at Harvard. Uh, and then he goes on to say that an analysis of potential race-neutral alternatives suggests that Harvard cannot achieve its goals, diversity goals, without using race. I mean, how do you square that? How do you how do you say on one side of the mouth that no race is not determinative factor, but on the other side of the mouth, oh, if we don't use race, we can't get our diversity. You know, right. so it hinges on the definition of determinative. <laughs> right. I mean, if you're going to take the stance that um, the fact that we don't admit only on the basis of race, then it's not determinative. You know then, of course, we didn't even really need to do an economic analysis for that. <laughs> um, and But I think that, that part of the reason they're doing that is that's the question at hand is, um, you know, what does it mean to be determinative? It's clear that, you, you know, you do get a large admissions advantage if you're black, and that's especially true if you're not disadvantaged. <laughs> Um, and what's the and what's the scale of this? Uh, I'm sorry. Keep going. Keep going. Uh, so th- that's clear, and I think Card and I, if you look at our estimates, you know they're not all that different. He finds um, that the admissions advantage it roughly triples your admissions advantage, your admissions prospects on average for for blacks. I find it quadruples it on average. You know, triples or quadruples, that's not where the line is undeterminative. What the line is undeterminative is, you know, depends on your def- your, your definition of, you know, if it has to be like it, it uh, increases it from zero to 100 uh, percent, you know, on average, <laughs> for, you know, because for some people, obviously, it moves them from being rejects to, to admits. Uh, it, by definition, racial preferences have to be determinative for some people. The question is how many people for it to, uh, 
for it to be illegal, I guess. What's the proper way to view, for, for our listeners to view the race penalty against Asian Americans? Is it something that can be made up with extra academic effort, for example? Or is it something that no matter how academically hard they, they try, it, it would be, you know, this penalty is going to depress their admissions even to the point where, you know, um, somebody much less academically competitive is, is still going to have a higher chance in them? So, I mean, I don't think that's the case. I think it's the case that, you know, that they, there is a penalty and you can overcome that, that, uh, that penalty. Um, and that's reflective in the fact that, you know, we do see that there are more Asian Americans uh, at Harvard than what their, their population share would be. And that's because they're doing so well. But it's also true that it is the case that you have to do better um, than other applicants. And that, again, if you're not in one of these special groups like a legacy or a recruited athlete. But, but the whole system sort of works in an odd way, right? Because if it was based solely on academics, then you would see massive increase in the number of Asian Americans. So, you know, if we based it solely on academics, over half of Harvard would be Asian American. And there's data out there from Yale as well, and it's the same thing. Now, recently there was a report that came out um, from a Georgetown center that sort of said, oh, you know, even if you did it all based on SAT, you'd see um, only small gains for Asian Americans. Yeah, what's up with that? I mean, I think it uh, either is incredibly misleading or just plain wrong because we know, like, if you look at the share of people who get above a 1,400 on the SAT, 37% of the people who get above a 1,400 on the SAT are Asian American. 37%. That is incredible. Um, that's... Uh, way bigger than their share at a place, at a place like Harvard. So when I say the penalty that they get, it, I believe that there's a real penalty against Asian Americans, but there's also a sense in which, um, you know, it, it would be a lot different, much, much bigger reason for um, this is, is the holistic emissions itself. They lose out because of the penalty. They lose out even more because of racial preferences, and they lose out even more um, because Harvard values things outside of the academics. Not that Asian Americans are bad at those things. They're just fine on those things. But they're so good at the academics that if it was admissions was based solely on tests, um, the, the fraction would be... Um, you know, about fifty percent at places like Harvard. We'll, we'll get to the uh, we'll get to the portion where I ask you a little bit about mer- uh, test based and grade based admissions versus holistic admissions. Um, but I do want to go to the district court's ruling. The district court sided with Card's analysis. Why did they do that? Well, I think um, they're worried about toppling affirmative action. And I think that uh, th- that's the issue lurking in the background here. Um, and that was very disappointing because, you know, in my view, this ruling provides a blueprint for discrimination. And, and I say that because, uh, you know, they were never able to, Harvard was never able to show um, why Asian Americans were scoring worse than the personal rating. What they ended up saying at trial was maybe it's the teachers. Maybe it's these high school teachers that are doing that. That was a conjecture. You would think that you'd have an obligation to actually show 
whether that was true. And even if it was true, it would be Harvard's job if it was discrimination by the high school, teachers and counselors, to correct for that. Uh, and it's, it's like they amplify it, if, you know. But there was no evidence presented that the teachers um, are somehow saying that the Asian Americans are worse on the personal. But what rationally, what was the deciding factor, though? Or not rationally, just like um, in the court's opinion, what was the reason why they went with Card's analysis? Well, so the court did say that, look, it does look like there's something fishy going on with the personal rating. Uh Uh-huh. But that it's not enough to overturn Harvard's very fine admission system. Yeah. (laughs) Now, the reason I say it's a blueprint, because... For discrimination. That was their that, actual quote, very fine admission system. That's yeah. what they said. Go ahead. Yeah, and you know, I I respectfully disagree. <laughs> 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 but this blueprint for discrimination, here you have the personal rating where there's a clear penalty. Their side cannot explain that penalty. They can't make that penalty go away. And we're saying that's okay. Well, Imagine a firm saying, look, it's not that we're discriminating against black applicants. They just didn't score well on our personal rating. We can't explain why they're not scoring well on it, but they're just not scoring well on it. And yeah, it incorporates things like likability. It's just, you know, we can't explain it. That would just be absurd. You know, if, if we take this, that uh, path at face value, then that's a blueprint for discrimination because you can just come up with a rating to do the dirty work for you. I, I like, I, I'm interested. You said this is a blueprint for discrimination. The court's ruling basically gave not just Harvard, but other universities and even other entities a way in the future. To discriminate. And, you know, this kind of reminds me of sort of the way that how, how Harvard how Harvard was able to do it. Um, and of course, this is up an upcoming challenge at the Supreme Court um, that will be decided at the Supreme Court uh, in the in the near future. But but how Harvard was able to do it, and the way that I see it, it's it sort of reminds me of the way that like a company tries to show that it's not a monopoly. Like Google's trying to show that it's not a monopoly. They like expand the market and they say, look, there's so many things that Google does that it only, that, you know, there's only like, you know, search is only just one factor about what we do. We also do this and we also do that. And we're not, we're not monopolizing the market. They try to make the market really big. And then they show that they're trying to complexify it. And they're saying, you know, it's a very long, complex system. And then, you know, we don't have a significant market share or our one of our products isn't dominant in the field. And I feel like this is sort of the same thing that Harvard is that Harvard did and was able to convince the court to do. They made the field very large in terms of the ways that they um, sort of evaluated applicants. They used everything. They tossed in everything from academics to neighborhood scores to geographic diversity to holistic admissions to personality scores. And they said, Look, like it's everything is a very long and complex thing. We're not discriminating against Asian Americans because we're evaluating people on a whole range of factors, and the court bought it. That's right, and I think embedded in that too. When you think about expanding the market, one of the way one of the ways that they did that was um, by basically saying, "Look, th- this is the part of the, that the court bought, which is if they're going to discriminate on the basis of race." They're going to do that against all applicants of that race. But when you think about recruited athletes, um, you know, I'm at Duke. Basketball reigns king, right? If you're really good at basketball, your race has nothing to do with it, right? Race does not matter, Um when you're talking about athletes and when you're talking about, you know, children of donors, 
the money covers over that. You're if you're going to do something to discriminate against a group because you're worried that there are too many of them, you're going to do it not against the athletes and the legacies and such. You're going to do it against um, the more ordinary applicants. I, I guess that's the way the court viewed it, and that I would disagree with that too. I mean, it's like uh, you know, if you have a uh, you know, there Harvard has many special categories, um, and um, one of them is legacies and athletes, and they grade those people differently. I mean, and the research shows it. You know, they grade legacies. Legacies have a five times higher admissions than non-legacies. You can't have a five times higher admissions than non-legacies if they aren't putting you in a separate pool. You know, and they're they're looking at you in a different way. Or if you're the children of a fifty million dollar donor, do you think that? Harvard's going to look at you the same way than if you're the child of a, of a broke dude. Um, no, you know? And so, yeah, I mean, I support the decision, your decision to, you know, s- exclude the alumni legacy, uh, Dean's list students from the, from the pool that you're analyzing, uh, because those people are, are graded separately. And we're still talking about 98% of Asian American applicants, 90 to 97%. So that is a what you know, a large group. Um, when you think about, you know, if you thought about football, you know, there was long a perception that black quarterbacks were discriminated against. Well, uh huh, yeah, you just looked at discrimination against all football players. Maybe you won't find something, but you might. Black quarterbacks, right? Does that say, well, we're not discriminating against the offensive linemen? You know, that's not, that should not be compelling. Yeah, no, that, that's a really good point. That's really, because I'm familiar with football and I know there there is that debate. But no, you're not going to say like, oh, we don't discriminate against black quarterbacks because we don't discriminate against black wide receivers. Look at how many black wide receivers there are. There can't be discrimination against black quarterbacks. No, that's not a compelling reason to, um, um, to dismiss discrimination. Um, so this decision, you said it was a blueprint for discrimination, a blueprint for discrimination. Are you saying that in the future, if the Supreme court holds up this decision that other colleges and even non-college entities, you know, like corporations or government, you know, or governments, or, you know, like if somebody's hiring for, you know, a government position, could use this blueprint, could use Harvard's blueprint, which is about expanding and sort of um, being very coy about, um, not coy, being, yeah, I mean, sort of expanding the list of factors you evaluate a person on and sort of being coy about how you um, evaluate these people. And are you saying that this is a way that people will get away with discrimination in the future? Well, I, I, you know, I don't actually know. I mean, I think if you took that literally, the ruling literally, yes, but I think it's going to all be designed to fit in to whatever, you know, the objectives are, right? So um, I can't imagine Trump Towers getting away with doing that against a particular um, applicant. Maybe if times significantly change and there's some of this, which I would think would be horrible for that to ever be, you know, turn the tide in that way. Um, but that sort of logic, that, that I think that the logic is um, scary. The, uh, you know, David Card is pretty famous for his analysis for his previous analysis where he found that in his, in his analysis that employers don't discriminate or not, not employers don't discriminate. Um, Oh, that changing the minimum wage and raising the minimum wage does not cause a significant loss in jobs. Um, did he apply any of that method of analysis into this analysis with Harvard? No, I think that that's pretty separate here. Um, yeah, I mean that was a that was a controversial finding. I don't necessarily have a problem with it 
um, that finding, you know, that this will sort of take us to decide. I think what conclusions you draw from that finding might. Uh, I don't think it therefore follows that increasing the minimum wage is a, a winning uh, plan for the poor. Um, in part because I think you know I've got teenage sons. They won't work at the current minimum wage, but if you raise minimum wage enough, they want to enter the workforce. <laughs> and then they end up taking jobs away from those people. So sort of no, no effect on em employment from raising minimum wage can mask distributional issues. Um, yeah, so I, don't, I mean, I, I don't really have too much of an issue with CARD with that. But that study, I think where that study has taken people on uh, policy implications, I think requires a bit more more nuance. Yeah, a bit more thought. Do you have any other thoughts on the Harvard case in particular that that you felt like that you feel like you really want to share? Well, you know, I mean, the other aspect to it um, is that I read the files. So, you know. I saw what was happening. You talk about this in your book, you know, when it was on Glenn Lowry's show about the file that particularly got to me. Um, you know, I think that there are ways in which you can make an argument for affirmative action, but I think that you should make that argument in an honest way. Uh, consistent um, with the truth. And for me, what bothers me about what's happening at universities, and it may be exactly because they're afraid of lawsuits like this one, is that they're obfuscating the truth in many cases. And we could actually be much more helpful um, if if universities were more transparent about what's happening. You know, so a lot of my results on, you know, the fact that there are a few blacks who end up majoring in STEM, those are things that can be fixed, but not if universities hide their data. So, I, I mean, I think that's the, uh, University should be about getting the truth, and um, I just don't think that that's that's been the case. You know, it's funny you mentioned the um, the the cases about the the admissions files that you've read, and you read many and many and many of them about the uh, Asian American applicants who you thought had some of them had just particularly excellent stories. One woman grew up in foster care and uh, overcame significant disadvantage. But then you saw on the application that the admissions officer rated her a standard strong, which is like the equivalent of like meh, like kind of, okay, fine, you know. Yeah, and I mean, you were pretty confident. The, Go ahead. The only thing they wrote on the file was SS, which means standard strong. And... That's good, but not good enough. And I just don't see how you could say that about somebody who, you know, dealt with the issues in foster care, that, which she describes in her essays, dealt with the issue of a parent who had a severe mental illness, dealt with the fact that, you know, her and her mom got hit by a drunk driver the summer before college, uh, before applying to college. And, you know, the alumni interviewer um, says this is the best, one of the best interviews I've ever had. Uh, it's just a, a sharp contrast to um, what the admissions officer did. So did she get in? Oh, if your standard's strong, it's automatic that you don't get in. Really? Yeah. Wow. That's interesting. And you can see that, again, Asian Americans are more likely to be rated standard strong, good but not good enough, 
and then the characteristics associated with being good but not good enough, it's clear that um, they're going to have higher test scores um, than the other than the than the standard strong applicants of other races. Well, this is why I um, this is why I asked you this quest that question before about is is this a penalty that you can overcome at Harvard or are you just going to be stuck with it? Because one thing that I've been thinking about recently is, you know, if you're an Asian American, even if you work really, really hard and get the best grades and the best test scores and show a lot of leadership in your lives, you know, people are the admissions officers at Harvard are going to interpret it like, Oh, he's just kind of an overachieving striver conditioned by his parents to do that. You know, I mean, what do you think about that? Well, I mean, I think that that's the case. Like, you know, this is why the college, you know, pe- people will, the, those consulting agencies will advise Asian American mm-hmm. students to try to appear less Asian, you know, in order to try to differentiate themselves from the fact that as a group, Asian Americans are doing so well. So Har- Harvard has something that they're looking for, distinguishing excellence. And when you're you know, looking at, if you're going to do all your comp- comparisons within race, then it's not going to look as good because Asian Americans are doing so well. Sort of being grouped along with other Asians who are also similarly high achieving. And then, you know, but the reality is like if, if the admissions were truly colorblind, that the, yeah, you know, those people really are at the cream of the crop. Um, but when you are admitting in certain racial categories and when you're looking at things in terms of race, which Harvard is doing, then you just merely look kind of standard because you're surrounded because your application is judged along with the other Asian applications. That's um, right. Yeah. Um, what's go is, are the, are the admissions officers at Harvard implicitly biased against Asians or are they pressured by administration to achieve certain diversity goals that causes them to make these evaluations? You know, I, I don't actually have a good sense of that. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, in the end, I think um, what what you do see is that Harvard always sort of shows you, here's what we admitted last year. You know, here's what fraction were Asian American and so on. In fact, they now keep track of your race they have these things called one pagers, which sort of say, okay, well, how does our class look at this particular point in the admission cycle? And on these one pagers, they show race three different ways, um, comparing with what's happening this year to last year. So I think that that's a part of what's going on is that you say, okay, they're never going to say that these are explicitly targets. But those sort of guide to make sure that the the class doesn't look too different um, in that regard. Yeah. Well, when the last thing that you say before you admit the classes is the racial proportion of the classes, then the process in which you're looking at applicants until that time is definitely going to be clouded by, oh man, you know, they're going to look at the races at the end. And so it may affect you. Or in fact, it will affect your evaluations if that, in fact, is the goal that they talk about at the end before they actually make the decisions. That's right. And it's very yeah. clear that it's affecting it. I mean, Harvard says that it's affecting it with regard to um, the positive racial preferences. But um, what they'll say is that that's not happening with the for Asian Americans, um, and and in fact, that was Harvard's argument um, from throughout. They said throughout the trial, which is um, your race can never hurt you, which is obviously false. 
because it's a zero sum game. You know, they're only that's the other thing they screw is that they have only have so many bets, um, and they seem quite happy when I said that a bump for one group is a penalty for the other group. Can we? It's equivalent. To that. That's just mathematically uh, true. Uh, but uh, you know, it, it's crazy. They get away with with uh, saying nonsense. Actually, there was an amicus brief filed by six hundred and seventy eight social scientists, you know, in support of Harvard, and it just makes you wonder: Does it take a PhD to to say something so silly because they say in the table of contents, it says the personal rating benefits all students by capturing. What? <laughs> How can it benefit all students? <laughs> How could you bet it? Yeah. If you're lowest on the personal rating, it benefits you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Let's, let's... <laughs> oh man. Is you know, it says social science research offers a number of non-discriminatory explanations for differences among average personal ratings. And their first thing is, is that they're more likely, Asian Americans are more likely to attend public high schools. Yeah. Which can uh, prevent staff from writing strong recommendation letters. Is that really what you want to base your, admit? you know, that's a discrimination if you're going to take from, wow. from typically from their viewpoint. It's uh, wow. It's crazy. Um, I feel like, yeah, I, I feel like the the Harvard, the Harvard case, and this is what I talk about in my book. I mean, an inconvenient minority. This is this is this is representative of how the people at the tippy top of the prestige. Or, or the incentives that the people at the tippy top of the prestige foot food chain sort of uh, sort of have to kind of keep um, the status quo. You know, Asian Americans they they present this meritocratic threat um, to how they think, um, not to 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 the policy of affirmative action that they've always supported. Um, to the sort of private school um, system that launch, that basically you know you can have connection that has connections to Harvard admissions officers that has been built up over hundreds of years that you know the Deerfield Academy to Harvard food chain um, the Andover to Harvard food chain and Asian Americans are coming in and and on the basis of merit kind of are insurgents into this admissions process. And you see these admissions officers and administrators like desperately trying to, you know, cling on to this old system, including affirmative action and holistic admissions and private school to Harvard factories um, that uh, that are that are being threatened by these Asian Americans. Well, and the irony is they sort of say, look, it's, the, you know, these academics, the test scores and such. That's where your income really helps you because you can get the test prep and such. Oh yeah. But, they love saying that. But the but the irony is is it's on those other things, those uh, the the non academic stuff where the rich have even more of an advantage. Yeah. Take Harvard's athletic rating, you know, that's an example where the way you, you do well on that athletic rating is to play a sport that Harvard offers. Well, Bart, Harvard offers sports that are primarily white. So, you know, over 16% of white admits are recruited athletes. That's way higher than uh, blacks who are less than 9% of their admits are recruited athletes and less than 5% of Asian Americans or Hispanics are recruited athletes. Wow. And you look at what the sports are, it's like sailing. You know, these are sports that require 
a lot of resources in order to engage in them. Yeah. Well, I remember this, um, you know, I lived in Princeton and I remember I went to this, there was this kid at, at my high school and, uh, his parents were, I'm just going to say it, obsessed with prestige. And I remember this kid would go to sp- squash classes, squash. Like there's nothing more 1% than squash. <laughs> right. And, and, you know, and I sort of asked him once like, Oh, how did you get into squash? You know, and stuff like that. He's like, Oh, my parents, you know, uh, encouraged me to join squash since I was little. And I'm like, well, I wonder why. <laughs> right. right. You know, and of course, the, the, the programs in the country that are, you know, elite at squash and that recruit in squash are Princeton, Harvard, you know, um, and Penn, those kinds of places. That's right. I mean, that was, you know, I think everyone has in mind that the legacy preferences are an issue, but it was really eye opening in the context of the case to, to see the way the athletics. Uh, mattered and what sports uh, they you know harvard offers and such uh, and how mm-hmm. that was a, you know a nice ticket a nice ticket in I, I think the evidence shows that holistic admissions actually helps the uh, wealthy and privileged oh um yeah yeah but comparatively yeah to merit-based admissions yeah and so now you look at what's happening where the exam schools, the exam high schools are now being taken out. Um, They're basically saying, look, we need to have more equal representation. And that basically means cutting Asian Americans and increasing everybody else. Um, Those are the public schools, you know, and so those people who can afford to get out and go to the private schools, they're going to do so, and they're going to still be able to get into, into those top schools. But you've taken out the, a channel for the people who don't have those means to get into those schools. To me, it actually reinforces uh, privilege as opposed to um, dismantling it. Yeah, and like I think 50... 50- 51% or greater than 50% of the black kids who get into Harvard come from private schools, you know, um, and 71% come from upper middle class or higher backgrounds. Now I know like 80% of whites and 80% of Asians also come from upper middle class or higher backgrounds. But the point that I'm trying to make here is that uh, you're not exactly admitting the kid from the, up, from the uh, east, you know, south side of Chicago um, to, to do this kind of thing. Um, by and large, you're still admitting kids through the preferred pipeline, which Harvard has always admitted people. Well, um, so you've been going through my book, An Inconvenient Minority. How do you like it? Uh, oh, or do you, do you see thoughts on it? Do you have thoughts on it? Uh, no, I, th- I think it's great. And the thing is, is in my own research, prior to the case, I, you know, I really wasn't aware of a lot of the stuff regarding Asian Americans. I've done work on affirmative action. I've done work on choice of major. Um, and sometimes they would have a small part that was related to Asian Americans. But um, because, of, you know, it's not as large of a group that hasn't been the focus. So you know, I didn't come in to the Harvard case knowing um, knowing so much about this, this issue. Um, and, you know, then I talked to your know, former students who, who were Asian and was like, really, you weren't aware <laughs> of, uh, you know, what was happening. So it, it's been very interesting and certainly paying a lot more attention to it now in light of um, what's been happening in our country with regard to race relations and, and such. I guess, I mean, obviously this was, this issue has been more pronounced in my community, in my Asian Chinese American community. It's been pronounced for years. Everybody knew Harvard was discriminating against us. Everybody knew Princeton was discriminating against us. 
But when I started writing this book and when I started publicizing it for the preparation, I realized that so many Americans just did not know. You know, um, so many Americans were aware that Asian Americans were, you know, disproportionately did better in life circumstances. Um, and they even, it even got to the point where, you know, leftists and liberal philosophers were now accusing Asians of like being complicit in white privilege because they were so successful. Right. But they didn't, they didn't take that extra step and actually see that Asians have been successful in this country, despite the discrimination that's been occurring at elite universities, despite the fact that Asians are excluded in most identity politics surveys you know, that are alleged to be done on behalf of helping minority excellence, that Asian Americans are successful despite being the minority that sort of threatens the, um, the, the, the minority that threatens the racial narrative and therefore is suppressed. You know? and, and to me, that was a story that needed to be told. That was a story that people needed to see, that, that Asians aren't successful in this country because they are complicit in privilege. They're successful in this country because they work hard and they have cultures of excellence. Um, and they do it despite the discrimination against them, not because of, the, not because of privilege. Totally agree. And what, what's, um, and that was another interesting facet of the case is, is I think that, you know, overall, I think Asian Americans have passed whites in terms of household income. But that is not at all true in, uh, among Harvard applicants. And that's what I meant when I was talking about the rates of being labeled disadvantaged are much higher. Than for white applicants, and that's because you know poor Asian American families are doing something incredible in their households uh, in terms of, of preparing them for higher education. In, you know, my view on this is I want I want to know what they are doing so I can do it. You know, <laughs> um, to learn from that as opposed to in any way diminishing it, you know, that we should be, you know, looking at ways to help families develop the human capital of their children. That's what they're doing. And, you know, I think what the New York exam schools provides an amazing example of this, you know, with where Asian Americans are at in the income distribution in New York city, and then turning to the fact that, uh, how, dominant um they are in terms of uh admissions at stuyvesant um last thing here for you peter the you and i you know we uh we both come from faith backgrounds and you know i saw you appear on glenn lowry's show and talk a little bit about this um and how your how your catholic background you know motivates you to stand up for truth and stand up for the dignity of all individuals. Um, how does that inf inform your approach to this, you know, this this larger issue of of sort of judging people on the basis of merit um, and sort of treating people as individuals, you know, in this culture? Yeah, I mean, I think that my Christian faith is informative um, on how I see the race issue, period, because, you know, I have very close friends who are not Christian. And that issue is actually much more important to me than what race they're from, you know. Um, it's just such a, a non-issue in comparison to that. And yet, I love my non-Christian friends. And I think that uh, I I think where it comes in is I do want people treated with dignity, regardless of you know what race they are. Um, and I also think that the the way we're going about it um, actually doesn't encourage that. 
and that's where it's it, it's hard to stand against the tide on that. But the promoting of race essentialism, um, I think works works against us. Um, you know, having that having that common bond and being able to treat people with dignity. The more that we see the other person as other, um, as belonging to some in group or out group, I think that that uh, that just has bad effects. And I think that's where we're really at. In society is, you know, you're on the right team or the wrong team, and that defines you. Mm-hmm. Um, which I is- just don't see right, and I I just see that I see that color blindness and the need to really shed looking at people just based on their physical characteristics or shed assuming people just because of their race or ethnicity as sort of central to the Christian project, right? Sort of central to the, to, to what it means to see other people as children of God. Um, and, you know, this is a, a, a kingdom that knows no race, no background, no ethnicity, no tribe, no nation. Um, but the unifying factor is identity in Christ. And to me, it seems like what Harvard, this, this ultimate, this Harvard admissions process, just the more that I look at it, the more that I see that race is their ultimate goal, the, the more that I see that, that they're, they're placing the definition on somebody based on something that they can't control about themselves. Um, and, you know, I see that as, as dangerous, you know, to the way that, that we look at people. I see that as increasing racism, not decreasing racism. I see that as um, sort of setting us on a path uh, where our identity is, is, is become something that we can't even control about ourselves. And uh, that that's that's sort of what motivates me. Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of it I would term is checkbox diversity. <laughs> um, but I also think that you know, as Christians, the other responsibility is to um, help those who need it. And that's again, regardless of race, but may disproportionately hit certain groups. Uh, I do think that there are issues with trust. Um, I mean, among Asian Americans, a lot, probably there is broken trust there on the, on the college admissions. And that's the, the way Harvard does admissions, uh, leads to less trust, um, in that regard. But I think that that um, a lot of the race issues, you know, how to figuring out ways to build that trust. And that's the only thing that holds me back on the affirmative action front. I mean, I def, I grow color blind, but uh, it, it is very clear that there's a, a segment of the black community community that doesn't trust the institutions. And how do we um, work to build that trust? Um, I, I don't think that the affirmative action is the right way of doing it. Yeah, and your research but, has shown it. But, but yeah, something needs to be um, done to, you know, to help restore that. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. No, I, I. You're right, and I think that. Some people do, even people who are my Christian friends, right? They view affirmative action as something necessary to help, you know, people, you know, who are, you know, lower in society or in society's view of things who are impacted by things like poverty. And they see affirmative action as a vehicle to help people get out. Um, But I've done enough research to show that, to see, and and so have you. And, um, you know, we're not going to get into that here. Maybe for another time, maybe you should come back. Um, and talk more about this. Uh, and, but you, and so I guess this is just a teaser. Dr. Sidiakono, Peter has done so much important research on how, when you admit people based on, you know, race and race preferences, you know, uh, 
even people who are going into STEM majors, you know, they're likelier to drop out of those STEM majors um, than if they were accurately matched to the university's level. Um, and, you know, you're not at that point, you know, they have lower graduation rates, they have higher rates of depression. Um, and at that point, are you really helping that person? You know, are you really actually, you know, creating an environment for them to succeed? Or are you just admitting them for cosmetic purposes that help the college, but don't necessarily help that person? Um, is that an accurate characterization? That's right. And yeah. when that happens, you break trust again. And so then that actually works against um, what we're shooting for. Yeah. Good. Well, thank you so much, Peter, for uh, appearing on the show. You guys, your listeners, I encourage you to look at Peter Sidiakino's analysis of Harvard's admissions data. It's actually available publicly. Just Google our Sidiakino, um, <laughs> and I guess you know you, you'll have to look at the recording to spell it right. <laughs> but our Sidiakino, <laughs> Harvard admissions data. And then you'll, it's one of the first links that you can see. So you take a look at yourself. Don't take our podcast for granted. You can even look at CARD's responses. That's also made public. Just search CARD, Harvard Admissions Data. You know, compare it for yourselves. See what's going on and get exposed to the truth. Um, but Peter, it's really great having you. Anything else you want to say? Oh, really enjoyed it and hope we can do it again soon. Yeah, let's do it again soon. Thanks. All right. Talk to you later. Talk to you later.